Now, the 11th edition of the Global Food Security Index showed that Nigeria ranked um, 107 from uh, out of 113 uh, uh, countries uh, globally in the Food Security Index. Now, by implication, this means that 12.9% of uh, the global population in extreme uh, poverty uh, were found in Nigeria as at 2022. Now, I'm sure uh, that figure obviously uh, must have gone uh, higher than what it is uh, as a then. So today on the show, we are looking at concerns around um, food sufficiency, and we termed it a sustainable approach. Uh, we've been joined uh, right about now via Zoom by Neona Usara. Neona Usara is uh, the MD CEO of Fadila Group's uh, uh, crop, crop Sciences. Uh, so good to have you on the show, Neona, and thank you to have held on for uh, as long as you did today. Thank you, Neona. Good morning. Good morning, David. Always my pleasure to be on the show. Thank you for having me. Fantastic. Uh, so let's begin the conversation like this. Where exactly are we as a country uh, in terms of um, uh, uh, food sufficiency? Uh, I know many would want to want to wonder if we have attained any form of food sufficiency uh, with the series of lamentations around um, hunger uh, that is uh, that could be heard as palpable across the country. But then, where are we in this index right about now? David, you know where we are. I mean, look around you every day in the news. Um, there isn't enough. That's where we are, simply put. Uh, we can banter data, we can banter number, numbers, but the fact is we are not producing enough. Um, so that's where we are. That's where we are. Mm. And we need to begin to look at how we can transition and how we can improve our productivity um, as a nation, if not, we will we will continue to 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 be discussing this topic. I remember it was September last year when I was on the same show, and I think we were discussing, and I and I stated that by January February, I predicted that there was going to be a significant increase in food um, prices. Um, um, I also, you know, predicted that. Um, well, I stated that if we do not strategically um, focus on dry season farming and supporting farmers during the dry season, that it's going to continue, the food um, inflation would continue for a couple more months. And that, that's where we are today. So this is where we are, David. Well, it is indeed a sad place that we seem to have found ourselves. Uh, uh, it seemed to be uh, in a sad place. Now, you did, you, did, you did one, I remember, I still have uh, footages of that conversation. Uh, uh, however, the essence of, uh, of conversations like this is to keep, you know, creating awareness, creating awareness to the managers of our economy, creating awareness on Nigerians on things that uh, uh, they should take a lot more, more seriously. Now, there is hunger in the land. There is food scarcity in the land. Uh, of course, it's not a standalone uh, conversation. It is, uh, you know, premise on several other fundamentals uh, that we just might even look at uh, today on the show. Uh, but then, like I did say initially, we are looking for a more sustainable approach. It is evident that um, whatever approach that we have uh, given to agriculture or to food or farming in Nigeria is not working. It's not working. We, we seem to be, we're held on a spot. Uh, so we'll begin, we need to begin to change our tactics. It, it's, it's, it's an idiot uh, that stays doing the same thing uh, over and over again and, and expects a, a, a new, new results. That's how it is. So it, it, it's important that we begin to restructurize our farming, agricultural uh, methodologies. Uh, Neona. I, I totally agree with you. So yes, we have obvious challenges and in the segment just before this, um, you know, your Ben Bruce, he listed out a couple of the challenges. We do have those challenges, obvious challenges, that, that goes without saying. But then let's talk about the, huh? the challenges that are not very obvious and it, it, it's it, regarding the approach that we have over the years used. 
Um, and, I, and I like that you asked this question and I like the topic for today because it focuses on solutions, not just, you know, discussing challenges. So this is where we are. I think we have erroneously gotten it wrong. We have mistakenly linked the number of smallholder farmers supported with enhanced food security. We know the data, 37% of our workforce is involved in agriculture primary production. 88% of those um, involved in primary production are smallholder farmers. Um, and 72% of those 88% live below the poverty line. So that goes, so in other words, we are depending on people who live below the poverty line to sustain the country, it's over 200 million people. And our focus over time as a people, as a government, as international development, as private sector, has we are focused too much on quantity of farmers, assuming it directly translates to increased food output. However, the real drivers lie in factors like land size, rich soils, efficiency and productivity practices that we incorporate. Simply, simply put, we have having more farmers doesn't necessarily equate to more food. In developed countries, in developing highly higher developed countries, the the percentage of the workforce involved in primary production is small. Like, um, okay, let's see America, I have that data here. So it's less than 2%. And that 2% is responsible for feeding over 300 million people and having enough to export. Whereas ours is, like I said, 30, 36.5%. I think it's time that we shift our emphasis towards the quality of agricultural practices so that we can, if we want to truly enhance food, food production. Um, you know, we have the goal, we have realized from what is happening that rather than livelihood enhancements, the goal should be food security. So in M&E, monitoring and evaluation, we have this concept, we have this tool that we use, it's called the theory of change. What it does is li it links intervention or project or activity, it links the it links it to the outputs or outcome, then outputs, and then the objectives and then the impacts. So the overarching um, objective here should be food security. And whereas in our case, we have put farmers' livelihood as the overall objective. But from what is going on now, we have seen that that doesn't necessarily equate to food security. So what I think is we should do is switch it let food security be the overarching objective. Let that be the impact. And then we as a people will determine what steps we need to take and how we need to also ensure that farmers' livelihoods are taken care of to reach the food, to, to attain food security. We know, let me paint two scenarios for you just to, you know, give it a, you know, bring life to it. Um, we have a group of 10 farmers, smallholder farmers who have come together uh, from the small business and they've been able to access a hundred hectares, right? We have 10 farmers accessing a hundred hectares. They want to cultivate soybeans. Um, they've done, they've invested in, um, you know, developing the land topography. They've done some investments in soil testing. They've engaged with a uh, seed council to ensure that they get good seeds. If you, David, are a financier, an investor, a funder, right? Would you support them? The second scenario is a group of 100 farmers with 50 hectares here and there scattered, fragmented, half an acre here, half an acre there. And they, they're also seeking investments, each individual farmer. Which of these groups of people would you likely help? So because our focus has been on farmer livelihood, the focus has been on helping the most number of farmers, you know, at the expense of food and have, at the expense of food production. The, the, the group of 10 farmers would have produced, because of all the practices that they've incorporated, would have produced sufficiently. They would have utilized the 100 hectares sufficiently to produce you know, at, at maximum yield. But if your objective is supporting uh, um, the number of farmers, which is what a lot of international development and even government have focused on, um, so that's where we are getting it wrong, and that's where we are not having that. That's why we are not having significant investments. Look, when we have enough food, 
that translates to increased economic activities and contributions, significant contributions to our gross domestic products. Imagine a scenario where we are able to achieve some sufficiency in a crop like soybeans, right? Investors would see the opportunity, set up soy processing factories, set up soy mills that would help create jobs that would stimulate economic activities in the area where that factory is set up. So you can imagine if we then do that for soybeans, for rice, for sorghum, for wheat, you know, ensure that we are not just supporting farmers for the sake of the numbers. In fact, even the approach hasn't yielded maximum best, best results that we hoped for. We still have farmers year in, year out because they are smallholder farmers coming in to access funding. Without any government intervention, they cannot farm. Whereas farming should be a business. Farming should be a business. If we want food security, every farmer should be able to make profit from his land. Let me, my mother has three plots of land in Port Harcourt. She grows coconut, she has a poultry. She's a smallholder farmer. But even under her small farm, she I, I know what she gets out of it. But she's a smallholder farmer. She's not looking at it as a business. It's somewhat a subsistence, a hobby for her. That is smallholder farming. We need to transition the way we regard smallholder farmers. Smallholder farmers should not be should not should should not be a farmer with one hectare. It should be a farmer with 10 hectares, five, 10 hectares. And when the farmer is responsible for 15 hectares, he would ensure that there are some practices that he would incorporate in his economies of production that would ensure the best yield for the number of the size of land that he has. So we need to transition, um, you know, our thinking and the focus should be on food security and then determine how we would get to food security. Thank you so much, Nana Soro, for your thoughts. Thank you so much, Nana Soro, for your thoughts about all these. That about that a taking a critical look approach about what will sustainable approach, what will serve, what will stay, what will serve, and then a statement under that future is a reconstruction, of the, a reconstruction of the past. Now, let me give you a tripartite question right now. At what point in time did we lose it? When did we miss out on food production? And then what are the factors militating against our coming back to that era? And finally, what could be possible solutions looking at immediate emergency, looking at short and looking at long term approach in order to give a final solution to food production in Nigeria? Okay, where we missed out, um, where we missed out is our inability to to be efficient. We've continued the same old practices that we've used we used in the eighties. Our rate of production has not kept pace with our population growth, so we are still using the same practice we used in the eighties to feed. Um, what was the population in the eighties? I'm not very sure, but that's the same practice that we're using. We have not modernized. We have not, um, mechanization is a far reach. Most farmers don't have access to mechanization services. Um, infrastructure has also not kept pace with the rate of population growth. We are still using, I mean, post-harvest losses is a huge problem. From the time I was little, we've been using these um, sacks to transport oranges from the north from the middle belt to the south. And by the time it gets to the south, half of the oranges are ruined. Whereas there are other ways to transport these oranges that will ensure that at least spoilage rate is less than 10% or 5%. We are still using the same baskets to transport tomatoes, to transport pepper. By the time it gets to its destination in Lagos in the south and the west, it's half of it is already gone bad. So Transportation um, infrastructure is a significant problem. Storage is a significant problem. When farmers harvest during the rainy season and um, they don't have access to dryers and they just store their products, that's a significant loss for the farmer. So 
cold storage is important, particularly for our vegetables, the way we transport our products. Um, you know, so the if transportation infrastructure is a major problem. And that's why I say agriculture, a sector like agriculture now cannot develop in isolation. We need the cooperation of Ministry of Transportation, Ministry of Water Resources, but irrigation again you know we need the cooperation the synergy between all these ministries all the sectors to work together to achieve a, a common objective or a common goal um so you know when there is there's no synergy and the infrastructure like i said hasn't kept pace with the population growth and the demands of today then that's where we got, got it wrong we did not develop i mean when you're growing up the, you know there's things you can do when you're five year olds you can't continue to do them when you're 10 year old so we need so we haven't trend, we haven't grown up that's you know simple in simple terms we haven't grown up um and then you know we're expecting that using the same method or approach that we used 20 years ago will solve today's challenges when well, we have access to precision we have access to tools and resources that can enhance our yield we have not invested enough in land development for agriculture we've not invested enough in soil fertility enhancement we can through um, soil through organic amendments or specialized fertilizers we don't conduct regular soil testing for nutrient management we've not invested in the land topography that to make it suitable for agriculture. How then can we produce enough to feed us? How then can we produce enough to feed the industries that we need? In my opinion, we have too many people involved in agriculture. We need to transition those workers to industry. And the only way to do that is to show up our food production, attain food security. Then we now have investors who are willing to invest in mills, in processing plants, and that will create more employment increase uh, uh you know increase skills we have a lot of young men being unproductive it, you know so in terms of the workforce the workforce is there so we need to transition and the only way we can transition is improve the efficiencies in the agri sector so you say um what was your next course your second question please i said what are the factors militating against our going back to that era where uh, food production was huge so we don't want to go back to that era. We want to move forward. Our eyes should be forward thinking because going back to that era just means, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's taking us back. We have better tools now. We have um, better technology. We, I mean, we have, you know, satellite uh, tools that can be used to determine what parts of the soils are more um, fertile, nutrient rich. We have all those tools. We have drones to to monitor security, to monitor uh, to monitor the crops. We need to we need to modernize. We need to modernize um, whilst retaining our you know local knowledges. But we need to modernize. That's the only way we can sustainably achieve food security. If we continue the way we are going, we will still continue to have this these challenges, these issues. So it's a myriad of problems that have thought that's not just agriculture. Like I said, irrigation facilities, we need more of that. And that's uh, our Ministry of Water Resources. That that needs uh, cooperation with the Ministry of Water Resources. Infrastructure as well. Um, we are still using you know, road transportation when trains would have been much more efficient to transport food around the country. So there's a lot of challenges. Um, but there are solutions. And in the short term, what we can do is help farmers to consolidate, um, in, incorporate modern practices, soil testing, fertilizer blending specific to what the soil requires so that the soil can be enhanced or enriched, um, helping farmers land, to develop land and make it equitably accessible for smallholder farmers. Like I said, bring farmers together, let farmers, let the smallholder farmers begin to act like large scale or medium scale farmers. Um, you know, the more contiguous land we can produce on, the better. That would also help with um, the, the feasibility of mechanization. So these are the areas that we can do in the short term. Um, in the medium term, of course, you know, shore up our irrigation facilities, begin to develop the infrastructure that would, you know, feed the agricultural and sector or industry. Um, look at the value chains. Each state, and states have a role to play. Each state has its comparative advantage in terms of the, the crops. 
that they produce, either crops or livestock or aquaculture, each state has its comparative advantage. Let the states begin to look at their own comparative advantage and de develop me short-term, medium-term, long-term plans to develop that sector throughout the value chain. And then look at the general problem, which is infrastructure, you know, that's also we can, so we can look at the, the general problem that affects all states and then we can look at the value chains um, as it affects each state. So let the states determine, look, this is our comparative advantage. This is the value chain we want to focus on and develop and begin to map out plans. If there, 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 there are skills out there that they can, you know, call on to support them. Um, there are people that would even give their services for free if they need support. So, you know, let's break it down even to the state, to the local government level, develop your plan, and then, you know, work with federal government to see how they can support. That's the only way. It's, 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 not, a, it's not rocket science. <laughs> it's not rocket science. These things can be done. It just takes the will. All right, uh, uh, Neona, uh, uh, Ben, thank you. Uh, Neona, quickly, uh, I remembered sometime in, in July of 2023, the federal government declared a state of emergency on, uh, on the agri sector. Uh, it's exactly seven months after the emergency was declared. And here we are experiencing huge um, uh, food um, shortage and scarcity or whichever word we want to use to describe it. Help me understand what was not done right, like, rightly in, decla in declaring a sort of emergency. What should have been the components of, of the declaration? Seven months is enough for us to have uh, been able to develop certain sectors within, within the agri sector and produce uh, quite a number of food uh, for Nigerians. Uh, I don't know, no. is it enough to declare a state of emergency? Uh, what could have followed the declaration of that state of emergency? So what should have followed was, um, it was declared in July and the next planting season was uh, the dry season window, which started, which starts usually in November in some states and extends up to February. What should have been done was develop aggressive plan, uh, plans and aggressively implement those plans for staple crops, for the rice, um, maize, um, soybeans, cassava, yams, um, those, those staple crops that um, Nigerians largely consume. They should have been aggressive uh, implementation during the dry season. And um, going by what is going on, perhaps there wasn't. So, you know, but that there, there is still hope. Um, I've, I hear that there's going to be, you know, party production. So we are, we are waiting and we are hoping that, you know, things get better. I mean, that things get better. But, you know, when, when a security, when a state of emergency is declared, you know, the, the attitude, the, the usual attitude is aggression. Um, because of uh, the impact that that could have, which we're seeing. So that's what I expected. Down, uh, you know, we are prone to flooding again, though we've not had the weatherman uh, uh, recently. But then uh, we experienced um, a situation where farmers were forced uh, to begin to harvest their crops halfway. Uh, and then th that, that didn't spell well for us as a country. Does this also bother you that now the dry season is gone, now we are going to the wet season, which comes with uh, it prones and its cons? Uh, have we been able to identify how we can maximize uh, the season? So yes, I mean, climate change is a threat, uh, but there are all mitigating activities that can be done. We could, first of all, we could, you know, conduct a vulnerability mapping. Where is most likely to be, where is most um, flood prone? Um, and avoid those areas during the rainy season and um, plant on the areas that are um, highlands. So uh, even, so last year, two years ago when there was flooding, I, 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 we had a farm and our farm was not flooded because it was, 
in, in an area where it would, there was no likelihood for flooding. So we can focus on those areas and implement, you know, you know, practices that would enhance our yield so that we can get the best out of those those lands. Um, so there's a vulnerability mapping, let farmer, our farmers avoid areas that are prone to, to flooding. We haven't had um, the NIMET uh, predictions, but you know, that's that's something, that's, that's a practice that we can, we can do. Uh, Meona, finally, how soon do you think we can exit these um, uh, food um, scarcity that has been experienced right now? How soon do you think we can exit it? Question for the gods, David. <laughs> do, do you think we should open the borders? I, I wish I, I wish I do, do you think we should open the borders? The, aren't the borders already open? I mean, people need to eat, so we need to make food available. And if that means opening the borders, yes. But then there has to be a plan. Um, how long will the borders be open? What plans do you have to shore up our production? There has to be a plan. Um, when we do things without plans, we see, you know, it, it, we spiral out of control and the impact is dire. So there needs to be a plan. People need to eat um, and there needs to be a plan to shore up production. So if opening the borders would, would, would um, uh, provide food for people, it's something it, can, it cannot we cannot say you know it's not something that we can avoid so but let us have a plan to how we'll exit this crisis that we found ourselves thank you so very much Daniel Osoro it's a pleasure having you come talk to us on on news urban Thursday and uh, Nayona is uh, the MD CEO of Fadila crop sciences uh, this place in Abuja. Thank you, and do have a great day. Are the rains down in Abuja right now? Because the rains are down in Lagos. Yes, it rained early this morning, so we are we are enjoying the cool breeze. Okay. <laughs> we are enjoying it. Thank you so much. Fantastic. So it's confirmed. It rained in Lagos today, in Port Harcourt this morning, and as well as Abuja. Uh, okay, so maybe it was uh, uh, across a national rain. Uh, in, in Nigeria today. Thank you so very much, Neona. Enjoy the rest of your day.